Good morning. Welcome to our talk, Distributed Routing in Ironic Integrated Open Stack Cloud. I am Rajiv Grover from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and this is Vivek Narsimhan from Ericsson. Our third speaker, Maruti Kamath, couldn't uh, uh, make it to the presentation because of a personal emergency. So it will be Vivek and myself uh, delivering this talk. So just to start off, how many of you attended John, uh, Jonathan Bryce's keynote address on Monday? So he shared a quote, which I would like you guys to uh, read through, because it kind of speaks into the material that we're going to be covering today. So give you a moment to read. So a few summits ago, distributed virtual router, DVR, was, submitted in, was contributed into Neutron. DVR brings great efficiency and scale into a virtualized workload. DVR disaggregates the routing function in such a manner that most of the routing is done within the compute nodes where the source uh, VM is in. So this way, it eliminates extra hops. It also scales as the compute nodes scale. And it also gives you a fault containment in terms of that the fault is contained within the com uh, compute domain. It doesn't, any, if something happens, it doesn't take the whole network down. Only uh, typically you are impacted with it, uh, in, on a compute node basis or even smaller. That works out great for a workload that uh, is virtualized, so has mostly VMs in there. But when it comes to a workload that includes VMs as well as bare metals, there is a gap that needs to be bridged. So just to put things in perspective, bare metal servers are here to stay for some time because of a number of use cases. Some of the prominent ones are three-tier architectures, where the third tier is a high-end database server. There could be policy, security, or compliance requirements, which kind of necessitates having part of your workload on a bare metal server. Then there's a situation where specialized hardware is involved. So like offloads, rendering, high compute kind of scenarios. Sometimes it's as simple as that there's a legacy application, which scales up pretty nicely. But when it comes to scale out, it doesn't, it's not architected for that. So uh, bare metal is involved. So OpenStack has realized this and has been actively working over the years to integrate VMs into the cloud. So the projects like Ironic have, been, have put quite a bit of work in there. In Kylo, the L2 Gateway was contributed into Neutron to bring VMs uh, in on a, uh, on a VLAN. So continuing on that work, we want to fill up this gap, have a workload that includes virtual as well as VMs, still be on a distributed routing plane. So we are here to share an approach, how to go about doing that, and we'll be going through that. So to start off, we'll just do a quick overview of these uh, components that we build upon, and then get into the nitty gritties of the uh, approach. So do, in this presentation, we'll be using these uh, diagrams quite a bit. So just a quick word on how, what this layout is and a couple of terminologies. So uh, to the rectangle on your left represents a compute node. The colored boxes inside the rectangle represents tenant VMs. The color of the box shows what network it is. So like VM1 is on a red network, and VM3 is on a green network. Then we use the term east-west to specify traffic which, with, which stays within cloud. So an example would be a one VM talking to another VM. We use the term north-south for traffic that is exiting or entering into the cloud from outside. So a server, uh, a VM accessing an external server would be north and an uh, external uh, client uh, addressing a service uh, hosted in the cloud as the south. All right, so let's start off with the DVR overview. Uh, for east-west, 
I'm going to take an example here. In this case, we have VM3, which is wanting to communicate with VM2. The VM3 is on green network. VM2 is on the red network. So it's obviously, it requires routing. So the way the traffic flows is VM3 asks for its uh, gateway. And there is a local router presence. That's the DVR architecture, which responds to these ARPs. Therefore, the packet from the VM3 lands up on the local router. The local router switches the network from green to red, uh, uh, looks up the MAC address of the destination VM, that's VM2, in its ARP tables that are pre-populated, and forwards the uh, packet out through the bridge. One small thing the bridge does is it substitutes a, a unique MAC as the source MAC, just so that underlay does not get confused where the uh, DVRs are. And the frame is sent out onto the underlay into the uh, second compute node. When it reaches the integration bridge in the second compute node, the integration bridge does the reverse. It, it uh, substitutes the gateway MAC into the source MAC field and bridges the packet to the VM2, and the communication is done. So that's the east-west path. Now let's look at the north-south. North-south, there's two use cases. One is the floating IP, and the se second is the SNAT. So we'll start with the floating IP. In case of floating IP, here's a VM3 wanting to talk to an ex uh, external server through the external network. So again, uh, the, it reaches its local router because that being the gateway. The router realizes there is a floating IP associated with this VM, so does the NATing to the floating IP and forwards the traffic right out the floating IP, uh, uh, floating IP namespace to the external network. Now let's just take a quick look at the SNAT path. So in this case, there is no floating IP associated with the VM. So it's going to be uh, typical use cases like upgrades and stuff where all connections are initiated from inside the cloud to the outside. So the VM3 sends out its packet again to the router. The router uh, realizes there is no floating IP associated with this, so this traffic needs to go through the SNAT path. It redirects the traffic to the SNAT namespace, which is residing in the network node. The packet reaches the SNAT namespace. SNAT namespace does the uh, source NATing and also adds it to the connection tracking, and the traffic goes out through the, to the external network. So that's the DVR overview. I'm now going to hand off to Vivek to cover some of the other components and start off into our proposal. Uh, thank you, uh, Rajiv. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to move. Uh, uh, you know, to some of the components that we'll be using in the solution. So uh, one of them, uh, you know, like before we move to the components, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of uh, what is OpenStack Ironic uh, for people here, uh, because the uh, the distributed routing solution that we are talking in this presentation is primarily to enable uh, distributed routing to work with uh, Ironic uh, enabled clouds. So Ironic is an OpenStack uh, project. Uh, it provides you the ability to um, provision bare metal servers as opposed to virtual machines. So it gives you a life cycle via OpenStack uh, to you know, do end-to-end -end bare metal provisioning and management. Uh, and then like this particular project was uh, integrated uh, into OpenStack uh, from the uh, Kylo release. It became official from Kylo release. And uh, when when it when when it initially became an official project, uh, it was uh, supporting only flat networks. Um, basically, you can spin off bare metal servers on flat networks, and then uh, you should have the virtual machines also running on flat networks, and then you can actually make them communicate. And uh, recently, as part of the uh, you know engagement between the Ironic team, uh, the Neutron team. And the NOVA teams, uh, you know, via collaboration, uh, we actually, you know, managed to uh, enhance Ironic to support, uh, you know, work, uh, you know, on VLAN-based networks, right? So as you know, flat networks do not give you a multi-tenant isolation. 
uh, however you know vlan based networks uh, vxlan based networks or gre based networks so they actually try to bring in this uh, multi tenancy isolation right so the tenant isolation uh, was embarked upon and completed during the meta metaka release uh, for uh, you know for ironic uh, use cases and basically the support was given only for vlan based networks so this is a brief overview of ironic and uh, so i'm going to actually uh, give a quick picture on uh, how uh, you know like uh, an ironic managed bare metal that's that's sitting on a vlan network would be enabled to communicate uh, with a virtual instance that's running on a hypervisor so primarily uh, in this use case uh, what happens is like uh, let's assume the fact that uh, the vm1 uh, is already spinned off and running on the red network uh, that that network is a vlan network and then we could also uh, you know say the um, customer is uh, trying to bring up uh, vm1 which is a bare metal instance using ironic and when he tries to actually bring it up uh, you know using an oa boot command by giving the bare metal flavor um, you know like at that point uh, the nova's ironic virtualization driver gets excited and then that actually talks to neutron and that tells neutron uh, you know like w which is the switch and which is the port on the switch to which this bare metal is uh, attached so neutron actually then takes this information uh, that comes as part of the uh, create port uh, api and then it goes and provisions the top of rack switch you know uh, usually uh, to which the bare metal is connected with the vlan uh, you know which is which is the uh, segmentation id for that network on which they are you know the bare metal is spinned off right it's on the same network the vm1 is also spinned off and so this now kind of enables uh, vm1 to talk to vm1 so this is the uh, uh, vlan and network isolation use case so it is this primary use case that was pursued and uh, you know completed in the um, uh, metaka release um, and uh, go and uh, now i'm going to talk about something about l2 gateway uh, um, i need to talk about this because while we looked at vlan network isolation in the last slide uh, you know by the virtue of the uh, by the virtue of the life cycle that we made to happen in ironic nova and neutron as part of metaka release we were also able to actually uh, enable uh, vms uh, that are uh, you know on a vx lan based network to be able to talk to bare metals that are actually present on uh, vlan based networks so before we embark on uh, seeing how the virtual instance can communicate with bare metal instance uh, you know even though you know they are using actually different underlays uh, i'll want to give a brief about uh, what the neutron l2 gateway is about so neutron l2 gateway is uh, is actually uh, an entity that uh, allows you to bridge uh, two segments uh, and uh, by enabling such a bridging it will provide you the semantics of a single l2 broadcast domain so primarily it kinds of tries to retain the semantics of a neutron network uh, like segments that are being bridged by an l2 gateway uh, these segments basically these uh, you know these segments or networks they can be neutron orchestrated which means they can be neutron networks or they can be uh, you know vlan segments that existed prior to a customer moved on to the cloud uh, basically they could be they could be an enterprise uh, you know uh, vlans that are being used by a customer before he actually embarks on transitioning to you know uh, using a cloud to run his workloads so uh, so segments that are bridge can be neutron orchestrated or they can be segments that are not uh, you know known by neutron also so then there is a concept of uh, multi segment network in neutron so so multi segment network is uh, a, a, a mechanism through which you can actually compose uh, you know uh, compose multiple segments into a single a neutron network so usually when uh, typically when uh, you know we spin off uh, when we actually create networks in neutron can create vlan networks 
you can create VXLAN networks, right? So similarly, there is one called uh, multi-segment multi -segment networks. So you can create a multi-segment network where you can actually provide multiple segments as part of a single network. S and uh, we will be actually using that to uh, enable, uh, you know, VM to communicate with BM uh, when when these two guys are on actually different underlays in the next slide. So, and typical deployment use cases, if you see for L2 Gateway today in customer environments is uh, to bridge, uh, you, know, um, you know, to bridge uh, traffic that is generated by, generated by VMs that are on VXLAN or GRE segments uh, to, uh, you know, the, uh, the bare metal servers that are actually, you know, running on VLAN segments. Um, and then like L2 Gateway as a service was uh, actually, you know, made available from the uh, Kylo release of OpenStack. So uh, just to uh, uh, go through it, like as I told in the last slide, a multi-segment of, uh, we will be, we'll be using a multi-segment uh, network mechanism. It will have one VLAN segment, uh, which is going to be used by Ironic ML2 drivers in Neutron to actually go and plumb the networking for the bare metal that's coming up. And then the, that same multi-segment network will have one VXLAN segment, uh, on which is the segment that will be used, uh, uh, you know, to actually have the VMs and their VNICs to be bound to this VXLAN segment. So virtual instances will continue to transmit and receive packets on VXLAN segments. Bare metal instances will transmit and receive packets on VLAN segments. Both those segments are part of a single multi-segment neutron network. So now we will be using the L2 gateway uh, to provide the bridging between this VXLAN segment and the VLAN segment on that single multi-segment network transparently, which means, uh, you know, the customer need not actually go and configure it, conf create an L2 gateway, put these two segments in it, and then enable the traffic to go through the L2 gateway device. So this will be actually taken care of transparently by Neutron by, 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 the, by the virtue of it figuring out that we have a multi-segment network where some bare metal ports are available, created by Ironic. Uh, bare metal, you know, uh, network po you know, like ports are available, created by Ironic. And you no, know, like we also have certain virtual mission spin-off on the VXLAN segment of that same neutron network on the virtual cloud side. So if you could see here, uh, you know, in this use case, uh, actually, you know, so when the VM, when VM1, which is actually on the multi-segment network end, on the VXLAN segment tries to transmit a packet, it will actually send the packet on a tunnel towards the L2 gateway. The L2 gateway receives the traffic and then actually, you know, mm, uh, decapsulates the, uh, you know, the, the tunnel headers and other things and then creates a VLAN frame and then actually sends that VLAN frame to the bare metal. So here the, the, the primary uh, idea here is the uh, ML2 drivers of Neutron would would actually configure the uh, the uh, the red circle shown in the L2 gateway. They will configure that particular uh, interface with whatever is the segmentation ID for the VLAN segment of the multi-segment network where that BM1 is residing. And then, uh, like you know, and similarly as part of the VM1 spin-off, the uh, usual open V switch. Uh, mechanism driver that's available in Neutron will take care of making sure that the VM1 actually is, uh, you know, put into the VXLAN segment of the same multi-segment network. So the key here is a single multi-segment network is used to actually spin off a bare metal also and used to spin off a virtual machine also. And we use L2 gateway device as actually the bridging entity that will provide you the Neutron network single L2 broadcast domain uh, data path semantics. So I'll, okay, I'm actually now, uh, uh, you know, trying to move into the, uh, into distributed routing. So what we saw all along was the, just to prepare the context for, you know, what are the elements that we will use in the solution to provide, uh, to extend uh, distributed routing to ironic integrated clouds. So we, we talked about how the DVR works, how east-west, north-south works with plain DVR in a, in a VXLAN enabled cloud. Then we discussed about uh, what is OpenStack Ironic, what is its role, uh, what is it, what it can perform uh, as that. And then we will also actually uh, saw like, you know, we, how, uh, you know, what is an L2 gateway and how we are taking advantage of it to enable traffic uh, from a virtual cloud to go into 
uh, you know the, the bare metal network side so now we'll go into distributed routing and uh, the, the solution itself so what we are trying to uh, so our initial goals for uh, you know the upcoming neutron release would be to extend the distributed routing concept to uh, to embrace uh, the ironic managed uh, bare metal servers so uh, you know that in turn uh, would uh, would have some sub goals as uh, as we see basically enable dvr on uh, vlan based uh, tenant networks uh, for ironic managed bare metal servers uh, we saw that switching is supported we saw a vlan network isolation switching we saw vxlan uh, network isolation switching so here we will actually support distributed routing on vlan based tenant networks for ironic managed bare metal servers similarly we will also attempt to enable uh, distributed routing for vxlan based networks uh, for ionic managed bare metal servers uh, and while we do so we will actually be using the l2 gateway component to accomplish that to enable the traffic translation across the vxlan and vlan and relays similarly we will also attempt to retain high avail uh, retain the highly available distributed virtual routing that's in place today in neutron as of mitaka release there is a session that that's scheduled after this that talks in detail about it so we'll try to retain high availability for uh, you know for dvr even for ironic integrated cloud deployments so these are our initial goals as we embark on you know trying to go through this uh, you know implementation so let's see like how uh, east west would work uh, in our uh, in our proposal uh, so you could see that uh, uh, you know let's take a simple use case where uh, vm3 which is on uh, network n1 which is a green network would like to actually communicate with a bare metal uh, bm1 that's on a different network n2 which is actually a vlan network right so what typically happens here is the vm3 actually transmits the uh, the its frame to the, to its default gateway which is on green network and uh, that default gateway is the distributed router that sits close to it on the same hypervisor so that router actually receives the traffic and then that router routes the packet back and then actually puts uh, the uh, uh, puts the puts the puts the frame itself on to the red network and then the traffic is directed towards the l2 gateway device and then what happens there is the l2 gateway device as as usual decapsulates the uh, um, you know tunnel headers and other things and then it actually passes the uh, um, uh, vlan frame to the bare metal instance so you could so this this arrow shows the uh, initial routing that happens when the vm3 actually you know tries to talk to vm1 and and uh, so uh, uh, this is how uh, you know like we will have uh, this is how the uh, the data path uh, flow happens for uh, uh, traffic that is initiated from the uh, mm, you know the virtual cloud side to the bare metal network side now we will see the return traffic say if we have the initiator is actually on the on the uh, you know on the bare metal uh, network side uh, and say he wants to actually talk to a virtual cloud instance that's uh, available in the virtual cloud side so here we have a bm2 uh, bare metal which wants to actually communicate to vm1 uh, both are on different networks uh, and so what happens here is uh, you know here i would like to introduce uh, something called uh, you could see that there is a red arrow with uh, dvr l uh, circled out right so dvr l is uh, the the it's a, it's an it's a new namespace that we will actually be creating to enable uh, a traffic uh, to to provide data path connectivity from the bare metal network side to the uh, to the virtual cloud side so the role of this dvrl is to actually provide routing uh, for all traffic uh, that is initiated from the bare metal side uh, and and then like you know and then pass that router traffic all the way as a switched frame to the destination on the virtual cloud side so in this case typically what happens is like when bm2 wants to talk to vm1 bm2 knows that vm1 is on a different uh, you know subnet and so it will actually try to figure out and try to actually r for the for its default gateway so when it tries to r for the default gateway the dvr l uh, which is shown in the red arrow he, he, that namespace would respond with its own mac address 
and so the BM2 will now send its uh, you know uh, frame to DVRL, and then DVRL receives the frame and then routes the traffic from the green network to the red network, and then the the packet comes out encapsulated again on VXLAN on red network, and then it it reaches the uh, destination which is VM1, which is on the compute hypervisor. So this is the uh, reverse path, uh, you know, like you know uh, flow uh, whenever when we have traffic initiated from the uh, you know, bare metal network side to the uh, virtual cloud side. So um, now I'm going to actually, uh, you know, leave it to uh, my friend Rajiv to continue to uh, discuss how North South is accomplished in an Ionic integrated cloud. Thank you, Vivek. So continuing to the North South direction, we again are preserving the same use models of the floating IPs and SNATs. And as you probably noticed as uh, Vivek was going through the flows, that the flows are very, very similar to how DVR works in a virtualized environment. So, uh, and you will see that similarity more so in the case of North-South. So let's start with the SNAT path. So here we have a use case where the BM2 bare metal wants to uh, access the external network. This is the typical use case which we think will be most prevalent because this is for VMs wanting to upgrade their software. The connection is initiated from the VMs. Uh, VMs typically would not want to have their presence uh, being accessible from outside, but they would be the ones initiating the connection. So in this case, uh, VM traffic just goes as VLAN or whatever normal, gets to the L2 gateway, gets out uh, in a east west fashion to its gateway, which is the DVRL, because DVRL acts as uh, uh, response to all the art for the gateways. Once the a uh, packet comes to DVRL, DVRL sees that it kind of visualizes, one way of visualizing this is that the DVRL sees all these uh, BM ports as if those ports were uh, resident within the same node. So it would do the SNATing, uh, it would actually redirect the frame to the SNAT namespace. Once the frame gets to the SNAT namespace, the source NATing will happen and it would be sent out onto the external network. I see some people are closely following it, so I'll give you a minute to absorb this. So in, in the SNAT namespace, there will be uh, the source NATing as well as the connection tracking. Very, very much identical to how uh, DVR in a virtualized environment would behave. Now, uh, let me move on to the floating IP case. In this case, there is a floating IP assigned to the uh, B, um, BM, and again, the BM uh, reaches out to its gateway, which is DVRL in this case, and the DVRL has it, it, it it's pro through IP tables and the uh, IP rules, same as is existing today, determine that there is a floating IP associated with this traffic. So it uh, uh, source it to the floating IP, sends it out through the floating IP namespace out onto the external network. The reverse path will be very similar into the uh, north-south phase. So that kind of uh, explains most of the proposal. Now we wanted to share some of the design considerations that went into this. We had some design principles and some uh, things which we discussed and uh, walked through. So first is we wanted to preserve the use model to be consistent what, what's available in the virtualized uh, uh, part of the workload. So preserve FIPS, SNAT, services. So we think they should work with this approach. We continue to use the constraint of no touch model that is not require changes into the BM, not requiring like uh, installing of agents or any helper modules or any of those configura special configurations. Third was the architectural compatibility. We want to be within the OpenStack framework, Neutron framework, all, uh, again, same uh, software models being used here. It's a pretty small extension to the DVR logic that's going in here. At the same time, we want to make sure that the other features continue to work with it, which already exist, and the upcoming ones, like the address scopes and stuff. We don't think this, uh, affects, uh, this proposal affects them in any ways. We considered high availability. 
because if you notice, there is one instance of DVRL serving uh, all the beams which are within that same routing domain. So we think the design pattern used for SNAT HA as well as some other HA capabilities in Neutron can very easily extend to this. Do not see any uh, special needs as such. Then we get to the scalability component. So in this diagram, we have mostly shown DVRL being resided in a network service node. But from a design consideration, we don't see that to be constrained. It can be on, in any of the uh, nodes, as long as there's only one instance per uh, router. So that would uh, eliminate bottlenecks or uh, any kind of you know, scalability concerns. Uh, there's also, uh, we are thinking there's approach in terms of scheduling. So intelligently schedule DVRLs to not being in a single node and you know, being in different nodes that should uh, help from a HA as well as scalability perspective. There were a couple of alternatives we were thinking about exploring. So one of the alternates which we see in future, it not immediate, may not be viable immediately, is to fold in the DVR functionality like, a, like complementary into a hardware device, like, like the way the L2 gateway is hosted on a device. So OpenFlow has some constructs that would fulfill, but that still leaves a gap in terms of north-south. So it's, it, but it, it is a future option that can be considered and worked through. The other option is to move away from the no-touch model and actually install uh, software into the BMs. So the reasoning, the rationale behind that would be that BMs are typically compute intensive. They are not network intensive. The reason they are BMs. So having a lightweight agent in, uh, in a BM might be worth the exploration, what it means and what it does. But that would be a future you know, extension or an or a uh, evolutionary uh, path to go forward. So that's mostly our presentation. I think we are uh, done. Thanks for attending. And we'll take uh, questions at this time. Uh, we have two mics here. Please, uh, uh, if you have questions. Uh, come over. Sure. Uh, I have three questions. So, have you guys already uh, completed the prototype development? Sorry. Not yet. Uh, have you guys already uh, completed the prototyping? Do you have? Uh, yeah. In other words, uh, do you guys yes. are working? So, yes. So, so we have work going on to POC this. Uh, wow. Well, Yes, and yeah, okay, uh, that uh, should be coming out sometime. And also, my next, uh, and also my next question is: so I think so it's better to uh, place the L2 gateway service onto the network node. What do you think about? Oh, you mean move L2 gateway functionality into the network node? Yes. Yes. Otherwise, so the network, so the network packet or network frames uh, goes through at least so at least two nodes. Right. Uh, we can reduce the network Sure. Cost. So, so there's, let me address that in two ways. One is, that is a L2 gateway specific question. Uh, coming back to our proposal first, let me attempt from this. You would see there's, uh, it traverses two nodes only when the traffic is outbound from the BMs. The traffic that's inbound into BMs actually just goes directly to the L2 gateway. There is no, uh, it does not pass through DVRL. It's, uh, yeah, if you. Go through that slide. Yeah, but. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yes, this picture. So, yes. so you guys so denote, uh, so, uh, so, uh, wrote this picture. So as if uh, the, this L2 gateway uh, looked like a physical switch. Yes, like, it is a hardware switch. Yes. Uh, well, so, really. Uh, yeah, then, okay, then my third question was. So, uh, so and uh, just to complete your first answer, the, the reason L2 gateway is in a hardware and is not on a network node is because Okay. Uh, it could be on a network node, but there's a translation required between VXLANs yeah. and the v VLANs. And actually, yeah, in short, yeah. this is a so logical okay. entity. So that's why. So I saw. So, so so you wrote like this. So so just a convention to do a presentation. Uh, in order to uh, so you wrote uh, so you guys wrote like this. So just for the explanation or uh, presentation. Uh, to be understandable for the, the audience here. OK. Uh, yeah, definitely. Right. Like this L2 gateway represented here is actually hardware. There, there, is, there is no software L2 gateway available 
available in OpenStack yet. We were about to pursue that, but since most of the vendors were actually using the, the using their Tor switch to provide the um, you know the L2 gateway functionality, uh, we we, the... we decided to actually like you know keep the software L2 gateway initiative on hold. Uh, for instance, so I think so that so that kind of uh, network switch uh, must provide a VTAP. Uh, if you the, the the customers want to use a VX RAM backed tenant network, yeah, in order to uh, so uh, so in order to bridge the VX RAM backed uh, tenant network and also the VRAM backed uh, yes. based, yes, right, okay, uh, yes. uh, then that is your assumption, okay? Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, yeah. the L2 gateway uh, shown here that will actually host uh, the OVS DB hardware VTAP schema. That's a standard. So through that, by programming that schema, actually you can create translation uh, uh, rules to enable a VXLAN packet to actually, you know, get it transformed into the the VLAN uh, the VLAN frame before it exits the L2 gateway switch. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's what uh, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question about the sure. uh, next slide for the return path from the VM1 to the VM. I believe it was. This one? Yes. Uh, from the VM1 to the VM, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, this one. Um, that is the actual data path, or is that the just for ARC kind of control? No, this is path? the data path. It's a data path, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Thank you for attending the presentation.